This episode is brought to you by my friend Rebecca Walser, a financial expert who can help you protect your wealth. Book your free call with her team by going to friendofdinesh.com. That's friendofdinesh.com. Good evening. I'm Danielle D'Souza Gill, your host. Dinesh is wrapping up his trip in Israel, and he is having an amazing time. He's gotten to see some incredible sights. He's given speeches while on a boat in Israel, which is pretty cool. He will be back before you know it, but I'm having so much fun hosting the podcast. It's great to get to know all of you, hear your feedback, and really go off of what interests you all have as far as topics I'm going to cover. So if you like the content I'm putting out, please follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Danielle D'Souza Gill. I'm also on Rumble, where I upload all my videos. And I'm still fairly new to YouTube, but I'm also there. And of course, please follow my Twitter at Danielle D'Souza G and my Truth Social account, which is simply at Danielle. But we have a lot of topics to cover today, starting with the Hunter Biden laptop story, which has information that was leaked by Elon Musk over the weekend. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. America needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. A food shortage could be coming to the U.S., according to experts. Drought, inflation, and new policies are pushing America's food supply near its breaking point. That's why survival food is more important than ever. Create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots Survival Food Kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years survival food. Hand-packed right in a family-owned facility in the USA and giving jobs to over 200 Americans. The kits are compact, sturdy, water-resistant, and stack easily. They have delicious breakfasts, lunches, dinners. You can make these meals in minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. Go to 4 that's like the number 4, patriots.com, and use promo code DINESH. You'll get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including this three-month survival kit. All guaranteed for an entire year after your order, plus free shipping on orders over $97. A portion of every sale is donated to charities who support veterans and their families. Go to 4 and use promo code DINESH for 10% off. That's 4 promo code DINESH. This weekend, Elon Musk made some big announcements. He posted on his Twitter that he'd be dropping bombshell information. Twitter owner Elon Musk has already confirmed that Twitter suppression policies of shadow banning and shutting down accounts has been entirely one-sided, that the company solely targeted right-wing and conservative accounts and messaging. But the recent dump of documents from behind the scenes at Twitter reveal that the company was also being directed by politicians and campaign officials alike. So far, Twitter has revealed documents pertaining to the specific topic of Biden's corruption by censoring the Hunter Biden laptop story. In a somewhat surprising move, Musk entrusted these files to Rolling Stone contributor and freelance journalist Matt Taibbi. Neither Matt nor Rolling Stone can be accused of being fans of the right or of Donald Trump. Matt refers to Trump as a mad king and his supporters as useful idiots. Perhaps that's the very reason Musk elected to enlist Matt in this effort. By giving the story to a known partisan, it would be hard for the mainstream media to attack his credibility. Despite this, that's exactly what happened. Blue checks all across Twitter spent the weekend accusing Matt of doing, quote, PR for the world's richest man, as if he was a partisan hack for Elon Musk. A claim, which Glenn Greenwald pointed out, was highly hypocritical, coming from so-called journalists whose only metric for reporting is how well their work serves their power and the Democrat Party. Personally, I think Greenwald himself would have been a great choice to report on these Twitter documents because he's a liberal who was forced out of the news organization he founded over differences in how to handle the original laptop story. Another great choice would have been John Solomon of Just the News, whose reporting puts him in the forefront of those who have been working and finding knowledge on this government-run censorship apparatus. 
But the fact that liberal journalists are losing their minds over even this light-handed treatment of them evidence shows how damaging the story is. According to Matt's reporting, Twitter was completely unconcerned with the Bill of Rights and instead was much more focused on how to spin their decision to suppress the story, given the fact that there was no factual justification to do so. Saying the incriminating laptop contents were hacked was a complete lie. The laptop was not hacked, and it was, in fact, completely legally forfeited by Hunter Biden. Disgraced FBI attorney James Baker had to leave the government after he was implicated in the partisan lie that launched the baseless Russia collusion investigation. Where did he go? Why, Twitter, of course. There was no real reason to censor the laptop story. But Baker backed the idea of censorship under the thinnest pretense, writing, quote, I support the conclusion that we need more facts to assess whether the materials were hacked. At this stage, however, it is reasonable for us to assume that they may have been and that caution is warranted. We simply need more information, end quote. Why does Baker believe that the materials could have been hacked? It's not like he's recalling what Democrats say happened in 2016. Not only was that untrue, but he was a central figure in the creation of that lie in the first place. If anything, Baker's own experience in running partisan interference for the Dems would predispose him to believing the material was not hacked and actually genuine. Note also that Baker acts like the reasonable thing to do here is to sit on the story, to await more information. What would more information do? It would give them evidence about the origin of the laptop story, and what is the laptop story itself? Evidence. That's right. Baker is basically saying that he needs evidence that may not exist before he can justify uncensoring evidence that's sitting right in front of him. Unfortunately, Matt doesn't give us a time and date for this Baker statement. Wouldn't it be very interesting if it came before that spies who lie statement, falsely claiming without evidence that the laptop was Russian disinformation? Did Baker make a phone call to some buddies in government right after writing that memo? Given his background, it sounds like something he would do. Details like this are why this information needs to be in the hands of reporters more familiar with the whole story. Reporters like Miranda Devine of the New York Post. Finally, one angle that most people are missing in this entire affair is that this is not just about campaign managers working with elected and unelected government officials to direct private enterprise to violate the constitutional rights of citizens and journalists alike. No, in order to censor someone, you need to know what they're saying in the first place. That's called monitoring or surveillance, and it's happening in each and every instance where people are being censored. They wouldn't know who to censor if they weren't already watching everything you say. We are American citizens. We have a right to say what we want to say. Unlike what Twitter attorney Vijay Gade says, that right is sacrosanct. That means that the government has no business monitoring the speech of its citizens. What we say is protected by the Constitution. Whether we whisper it in our home, say it to a friend, type it in a text, or shout it atop a so soapbox on a street corner, that's none of the government's business. But it's very clear that the government has made its, its business for such a long time that they even forgot to pretend like it's not supposed to be happening in the first place. At the end of the day, the real takeaway here is not just that our tax dollars are paying people to suppress our speech and interfere it's that we have been living in a surveillance state that has given the government and these tech companies far too much control over our lives for far too long. We need to do a better job of recognizing that when the government issues statements about controlling rumors and fighting misinformation, what they're really doing is justifying the monitoring of our free speech. It's time we assert our constitutional rights and rip these apparatuses out of the hands of those who've forgotten the meaning of the word servant in public servant. The fact that this censorship is based on surveillance may be why Jack Posobiec says the cover-up wasn't an intelligence failure, but an intelligence operation. He points out that it was Baker's buddies in federal law enforcement who told Twitter the Hunter story was a hack by Russia. That's yet another instance where the FBI and DOJ have taken it upon themselves to engage in interference in order to ensure their desired political outcome. It's a huge crime, dripping with treasonous pretenses, the likes of which our jailed January 6th protesters would never dream of committing. 
Many of the January 6th protesters are being charged through a novel interpretation of the law regarding interference in an official proceeding. But how many of those same government drones worked or are working to influence every outcome since 2016 and going into 2024? Are they then not also guilty of the crime of interfering in an official proceeding? Something tells me they would wither if put to the same standards as your random conservative protester. But now that this information is finally public, we can at least start asking the right people the right questions about what kind of country they think they're running. And that's a start. Hopefully this sunlight will lead to some much needed changes across the board. Maybe that's also why Elon Musk explained his decision to make Twitter's files public, saying, quote, this is a battle for the future of civilization. If free speech is lost even in America, tyranny is all that lies ahead. Will the absence of a red wave during the midterms lead to a more emboldened Biden, more pork barrel spending, higher taxes, a deepening of inflation? If you're unsure how the next two years will unfold, talk to Birch Gold Group about protecting your savings with gold. That's why I buy gold from Birch Gold, and you can too. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals. That's right. They'll help you own gold and silver in a tax-sheltered account. Here's what you need to do. Text Dinesh to 989898 to claim your free info kit on gold, and then talk to one of their precious metal specialists. They will hold your hand through the whole process. Protect yourself with gold today by texting Dinesh to 989898. With an A-plus rating in the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers, Birch Gold is who I trust to protect my future and yours. I'm delighted to welcome to the show Kyle Rittenhouse. Kyle is known for defending himself in a high-profile case where he was found not guilty. He is now an advocate for the Second Amendment. Kyle, thanks for joining me. Hi, Danielle. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. I know that I saw you recently um, in Florida, which was so much fun. And I also got to interview you, I think, earlier this year, which was great. Um, but how have you been feeling lately since so much time has passed since your trial? You've hopefully had some time to yourself to recover. I've been doing good. I've just been hanging out. Um, I remember I uh, saw you at the Mar-a-Lago event for the 2000 meals premiere. That was amazing. It showed a lot of evidence of the election fraud. Um, but I just been spending time with my girlfriend, um, going on a couple shows here and there and just trying to live my life. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You deserve it. When you think back to the trial and think back to just how crazy the media was in a lot of the, you know, defamatory things they said about you. Do you think you kind of learned some lessons about the media? Because I imagine before that you were probably living your life and not really thinking too much about, um, some of those crazy things. Well, yeah, I've learned that the media pretty much has the power to control anybody's life. Thank God for independent journalists, because honestly, without them, I think the media may have gotten away with their false narratives. Um, yeah, they, they painted me a white supremacist, a racist, and all these other defamatory things when I was none of those. And it really hurt me and it hurt my future. Mm. What do you feel like are some ways it, it hurt your future? Well, for an instance, I can't go out in public because there's some people out there that actually do believe those false things that the media said about me. They do believe I'm a murderer. They do believe I'm a racist. And it's scary because they want to cause harm to me. Wow. And so it, it's, feels, it feels almost unsafe. Absolutely. And like for potential job opportunities, I don't think I'll ever have a fair shake at getting a job. Say I want to fly for like American Airlines or United or do something like that. They may not want to hire me because they're going to, because of some, some reason. I don't know why, but. Right. Yeah. It seems like they've almost, I'm sure it's what you want to do, but in a way they forced you into doing conservative things because and maybe it's what you want to do anyways. But just because like you said, maybe getting a more of a normal job that's not political might not be an option because they've demonized you so much. Absolutely. And then they gave me this platform and I'm going to use it. Like they expect me to be quiet, but I'm like, you gave this to me. So why would I do that? 
Exactly. Yes, you should make the most of it and use it as a chance to, you know, talk about all of these important issues, especially the Second Amendment, because you are defending yourself. And sometimes I think people miss the fact that they should also have the right to defend themselves. Maybe they haven't found themselves in a situation like that. But if they did, I think that they would also want to use that right. Do you do you find that you try to bring this back as a self-defense issue? Absolutely. Um, I actually spoke to the Second Amendment caucus a few weeks ago. I gave a speech there and I talked to them about how the Second Amendment saved my life and how I'm thankful that they're continuing to fight for pro-Second Amendment uh, politicians and pushing uh, new gun laws that allow people my age to carry guns. Yeah, definitely. That's really exciting. And it's it's great because I think we had a big Second Amendment win in New York where, I mean, they're still trying to kind of limit it. And so that it's like each street you're on, there's some different kind of rule because of kind of public space and a private space and all of that. But in general, it's much better than it was where you basically couldn't carry a weapon at all unless you had proven that you had somehow um, gotten death threats. And and then even then it, it takes months, years to get that kind of permit. So basically impossible. So you basically just have the weapon in your home, but then that is only useful if someone breaks into your home. Whereas a lot of crime happens when you're on the street, going to work, going to school. Um, and we've heard about some crazy crime going on in cities and it's just spiking all over the nation. When you see just this upsurge in crime, do you feel like that reminds you even more about the importance of the second amendment? Absolutely. And just our fundamental God-given right to defend ourselves. If you're attacked, you should have the ability to protect yourself, your family, and your loved ones without having to worry about, am I going to get in trouble if I do the right thing? And now I'm actually, so to bring it in, I'm actually facing a civil lawsuit because I defended myself. So now people are probably going to have to worry about that if this goes the wrong way. Oh no. So wait, what do you mean by that? This is a a new lawsuit? Yes. I'm currently being sued by the family of Mr. Huber, um, in the Eastern district of Wisconsin. And it's, it's a ridiculous lawsuit, but it's costing a lot of money to defend. Um, you can go to www.gibsendgo.com forward slash Kyle Rittenhouse to donate or send a prayer because prayers and donations are really helping. Yeah, for sure. That's crazy. Do you think they just want to continue the lawsuits as long as they can? You know, after this one, maybe it's another person who feels like they've been wronged. I I hope not, but I can see that being the possibility. I could see them trying to just drain me into like absolute to where I can't even defend it anymore. I'm barely, barely able to defend this one. But I think that's their ultimate goal to make it to where like, oh yeah, we're just going to drain you into debt and get away with our own narrative. Yeah, for sure. Do you think you'll potentially be bringing forward any lawsuits against the media for defaming you? Yes. I'm currently working with my attorney, Todd McMurtry to bring some forward um, as we speak. I know it's been a long time coming, but we just want to get it right. And we want to make sure it's done correctly. For sure. Um, But on a more personal note, I know you have a very sweet girlfriend. I had the pleasure of meeting you guys and connecting with you both on social media, which was fun. I love seeing you guys make a Barnes and Noble trip. You got to check out my book and Charlie Kirk's book. Um, So how did you guys meet? So that's actually a really interesting story. Um, So she actually does like she's very conservative and she posts very political conservative things on social media. And I saw her on Instagram and then TikTok. So I added her on Snapchat and we started connecting. Um, and I found out we had a lot in common and about um, things we believed in, like the second amendment, first amendment, um, the pro-life issues and just our walk with God lined up. So we just clicked and I invited her to Mar-a-Lago for the 2000 meals event and she came with, and that's the first time we met in our first date. No way. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I hope that you impressed her with your first date. I hope so. Oh no, I'm sure you did. She's great. And it's great that you both share the same values. You're both conservative. Cause I feel like it's hard because sometimes a lot of young men, especially today, I think struggle to meet a conservative woman. It's, it's difficult. I've heard, but 
it's good if she's outspoken about her views. And so that makes it clear what she believes. So that's great that you guys have that in common. Absolutely. Man. And so when you speak to young people, you mentioned you spoke to the Second Amendment caucus, you do events. Um, when you speak to young people out there who may not fully understand the meaning behind our Second Amendment, they see the news, they see a school shooting, they see something bad happen and just think guns are bad because that's what the leftist media has told them. What would be your advice to them and what would kind of be your rebuttal of that argument? Well, so their argument is we don't need um, AR-15s or high-capacity magazines. And I, my argument for that is, well, an AR-15 saved my life. And then my other argument, the high-capacity magazine, a pistol standard magazine is around 15 rounds. An AR-15 a standard capacity magazine is 30 rounds. Like, we, like... I, that's standard. That's not a high capacity magazine in any, any way. And, um, my advice, what I would say to them is if we have people that are armed, if we have campus carry, we have students who are responsible, who are carrying a concealed handgun and there is God forbid a school shooting at that school, they're able to stop that, that person who's causing harm to other people. They're able to, um, to save lives, just like uh, Elijah Dickin did in the mall shooting in Indiana with constitutional carry. He was able to stop that shooter with eight shots from 40 yards away. So if we had more people who trained and carried and the laws were in our favor, I personally believe that constitutional carry for pistols should be lowered to 18 to 20 um, because 18 is the voting age and you can enlist in the military at 18. Why can't you carry a handgun? And yeah, I think if more people were able to carry and the laws were in our favor for that, I think this, the shootings in general would just go down. I think there would be more responsible people out there, more responsible gun owners, because truth be told, the people who are doing these terrible, terrible, horrific things, most of them didn't get the guns legally. I know the media likes to say, oh, they got the gun legally. No, like they took it from mom or dad or they got it illegally. Look at Chicago for an instance. Half those guns on the street there aren't legal. For sure. Yeah. And they always think, oh, yeah, if we ban them, then we'll stop all this. And it's like, no, you'd only prevent good people from having these weapons. It's not like all the criminals, all the bad guys are just going to hand over their illegal weapons. Um, not to mention, like you said, I think if someone is wanting to steal it from a parent or whatever, I mean, that's still going to be something that we can't completely prevent as far as getting rid of the weapon. So, um, yeah. And I think there's also so much mental health crisis. And so it's not really the fault of the weapon. It's clearly the person who is very disturbed, who is struggling with some other issues, which you would think the left would care about that and um, wanting to address those problems. But it seems like they don't actually want to get to the heart of the problem. Yep. Everything is the gun guns fault to the left. Um, mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. There's a lot of mental illness and that is the, that, that is the root of the problem. It is a mental illness to think it's okay to go into a school and shoot a bunch of innocent people or a mall. It, it's disturbing. And it's people that need help and nobody wants to focus on that. They want to focus on stripping away people's rights Right. And I hear you have a new video game coming out. So tell us about that. Yeah. So we released a video game on Thanksgiving to help fund some of these lawsuits. It's uh, it's a Kyle Rittenhouse turkey hunt. Um, and you can go to Rittenhousegame.com to order it now and actually play it. It's pretty fun. My dog, Milo, he's featured in the game. He can help uh, uh, get some of the turkeys. And the turkeys are the fake news. And you're fighting against the liberal news. Nice. That is so fun. I love that. We used to always shoot a turkey on Thanksgiving, which is really fun. And then we'd eat it. We'd have like a store-bought turkey just in case, but then we would have the fresh turkey, which was always so good. So yeah. Wild turkey so fun. is delicious. Oh my gosh. Well, congratulations on the video game. Good luck with all of the lawsuits. And it was so great to talk to you, Kyle. Thank you, Danelle, for having me.
Aches and pains come to us all eventually, whether from the normal wear and tear of time or from injury. You have the choice to feel trapped by aches and pains, or you can fight back against it. The tools are different from a decade or more ago. Now there's 100% drug-free relief factor. I fought back with RF and you can too. RF supports your body's fight against inflammation that is the source of aches and pains. About 70% of over half a million people who try Relief Factor order more because it works for them. You have nothing to fear and everything to gain. Isn't it time for you to get out of pain? I've heard great things about Relief Factor. If you know someone who has experienced aches and pains, this is the perfect gift for them. I know that my mother-in-law, who had a very invasive knee surgery, tried Relief Factor and found that it worked wonders for her. You should give it a try, too. Your first step to becoming pain-free just might be to order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of only $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more about this offer. That's relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246. Feel the difference. I am delighted to welcome to the podcast Vish Burra. Vish is a journalist. He's done some really cool things with Steve Bannon. He's actually present and part of the Hunter Biden laptop story, which is what we're going to talk to him more about today. So Vish, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Danielle. It's always a pleasure. Oh, great. Well, I'm very excited to talk to you because we've been talking a little bit today about the Twitter story about Elon Musk kind of revealing this information um, regarding Hunter Biden's laptop and the suppression of that whole story. But I wanted to talk to you because you had a very pivotal role in this and a very um, kind of like behind the scenes role, but was a really big part of the laptop being discovered and um, the information being published. And I know that we have like a lot of like mutual friends involved in the same story, but I wanted to have you on so you could tell us a little bit just about kind of how did you get pulled into this? How did you first find out about the laptop? Yeah. So at the time uh, around uh, August to September of uh, 2020, I was working on the uh, War Room podcast with Steve Bannon. I was his producer. And uh, at that time, he had just been arrested on the boat, remember, and the, the, there was that issue during 2020, which he was pardoned for. Um, and after he came back out, he uh, looks at me and he says, uh, pack your stuff. We're going to New York. We don't know when we're coming back. And so one, and, and so we're you know, living in this hotel, uh, by St. Patrick's cathedral for like, you know, almost, almost two months. And, um, you know, in, dur in the first week that we're there, uh, I I'm driving him back and forth to Rudy Giuliani's place all day. And I'm, I'm just like, Hey, what's going on? You know, what are we doing? What's the operation up here? And he said, look, you can't tell anybody, but I think we have Hunter Biden's laptop. And at which point I said, hey, you know, Steve, I used to be a software professional before I got into politics, before I got into any of this stuff. So if you need help with, you know, the laptop, I'll, you know, I'll see what I could do, you know. And at which point he was like, you know what? He got got me a copy of it and then said, make this thing your best friend. And I eventually, you know, become the sort of chief navigator for him of the of the laptop. And uh, I also end up learning how to make a copy of it. So I could, so I've become one of the people that is actually able to create more copies of this and distribute more copies of this as well. So in that time, you know, as I'm helping him put it, you know, we, we had the laptop and there's a ton of information, right? 250 gigabit, gigabytes worth, but we have to, we only have about two months before the election happens. And we are essentially trying to create an October surprise. And so while we're here, it, while we're in, Manhattan, you know, basically extracting and researching the information that's available on the laptop. I called it the Manhattan Project because we were essentially creating a, a nuclear political weapon. Um, that's, you know, we needed to, uh, once we had the stories that we thought were there, which was originally the Ukraine story, then there's the bigger China story, um, and then there's obviously all the lewd uh, pictures and all, all that controversy of, you know, I guess, his uh, off off field activity, Hunter Biden's off field activities. But once we got to the point where we had the stories ready, you know, working with Steve, working with Rudy, working with Bernie Carrick, uh, that's when we had to figure out how are we going to deploy this information into the uh, actual ether, you know. And that's Steve's first uh, 
uh, strategy was let's go to the Daily Mail, which the Daily Mail gets the most clicks online. And so that would be the best sort of nonpartisan uh, avenue to uh, publish that story. When the Daily Mail contact that we had basically said, no, I'm not going to run with this story, that's when we were faced with a problem. Where else can we go that would make the story believable? Right. And so now when that happens at the time, I am thinking, how can we solve this problem? And I remember I had, and her name is Emma Jo Morris. And at the time, Emma Jo Morris was the deputy politics editor at the New York Post. And I had met her previously about a couple of years before that while I was a software professional, while I was just posting memes on Facebook. We randomly added each other on Facebook. And she's like, I love your memes. They're based, they're esoteric, they're all this stuff. And uh, we should meet up and hang out. And we immediately became best friends. And she was working on uh, Hannity's show at the time. So I turned around to Steve. I said, hey, do you have any problem with publishing it in the New York Post? He said, no, actually, I'm open to that. I was like, look, I got a friend named Emma Jo Morris. She's really good. We can trust her. Why don't we pitch it to her? And he said, are you sure we can trust her? I was like, Steve, she's on our side. We're good. And that's when he's like, okay, send me your number. I texted Emma like, hey, Bannon's about to call you. You need to pick up. And that, that's when, you know, the, uh, Steve basically calls her and says, I got the story of a lifetime. And the rest is history, right? Now, uh, it's just... Emma Jo Morris is, is is one of my dear, dear friends, and she's so brave for even for even going through with this story. And, you know, there was a whole lot of consternation that she went through just in trying to validate the story and just trying to come to a, a state of being able to believe it enough to put her name on it and publish it through, you know, one of the oldest newspapers in America. People forget that the New York Post uh, is a 200-year-old institution that was founded by Alexander Hamilton, one of our nation's founding fathers. And yeah. so, you know, people don't realize that, that there was a lot that still went behind validating the whole thing. And Emma Jo Morris and Miranda Devine uh, were at the forefront of pushing that through uh, New York yeah. Post. So when that whole story came, came out, I'm sure you thought this is going to be an October surprise. This is going to be a big story. You were part of getting information off the laptop, contacting her from New York Post to publish the story. So when the story came out and it turned out to end up sort of going dead because of the suppression of the story, what was your reaction at the time? Yeah, so I remember the morning uh, when the story dropped in the New York Post, I think it was October 14th um, uh, of 2020. First thing I did, I ran out to the uh, bodegas in New York City trying to get a paper copy uh, of, uh, of, the, of the New York Post. Unfortunately, couldn't find one. But I'm also doing the research for you know from the morning shows, watching the morning shows, see who mentions the story, um, you know, on air because I'm gonna, you know, I'm trying to cut those things and put them on War Room by 10 a.m. And there was nothing, and that's when and War Room became the first place that's kind of on air, you know, via audio, via video, uh, covering the Hunter Biden story and, and talking about the New York Post article. And I'm looking through Twitter. I'm I'm doing all my research. There's nothing. I can't find mm. any puzzle about it anywhere. And that's when I'm like, this is fishy. But obviously, you know, there were friends who were paying attention and they tried to uh, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter. And that's when sort of what was happening revealed itself. Uh, my friends were texting me saying, hey, I can't share this, uh, this, this uh, article by Facebook Messenger I can't share the. I can't tweet this article out or share it via via Twitter DMs, and I, I tried to do it myself, and it didn't work. And that's when I realized that there was a major sort of suppression campaign involved. And then to find out that the New York Post got locked out of its Twitter account, right? That you know that that's an, also an interesting part of the story that we need to look out look after. Not just the suppression of the story. But then how did they come to the decision that, that they would lock the New York Post out of its account as well? And so all these extraordinary steps are being taken to suppress the story. And then a couple days later, you have the report or the letter signed by the 50 intelligence officials who uh, said that the laptop is Russian disinformation 
And that's the story that was ran through the media and was blown up on social media. And that was allowed to grow. And, you know, that's when I sort of realized that, oh, man, it's one thing to think that big tech and, and, and Facebook and Twitter and Google and Amazon are not on your side or working against you. And the media is doing that as well. But here we have the intelligence apparatus, the intelligence agencies and the national security agencies and the law enforcement agencies also possibly involved in this and covering this up as well. And so mm -hmm. I think that is when the meta story basically uh, popped open, which is the censorship of the story and what happened behind it. And it's taken two years until now to get it, you know, to get to find out with the Twitter files and Elon Musk, how that happened. Right. And when you saw the information revealed by Elon Musk recently, um, regarding Hunter Biden's laptop, what was kind of your reaction to that? It's a scandal, right? That's the part, the, the whole idea, whether the Biden campaign could do it, whether the, whether the Trump administration or the Trump campaign can have free speech taken down without you even knowing about it, right? And then I'll, these Twitter, you know, executives, whoever were called to the stand and whatnot, so being able to not even have to disclose that part, Right. And then finding out, you know, the FBI came to Zuckerberg and the FBI had been giving trainings to these folks uh, on, you know, how, you know, crush foreign information and for foreign malpractice or whatever. You know, that is, um, I think, the true, true scandal uh, of the entire thing. And, it, you know, people look, people need to go to jail because it was one thing already. If people thought the election was stolen based on the votes. Um, and how the voting, you know, and your, your father did a fantastic job covering that in 2000 mules and how that happened. Right. But there's also this aspect where a, a true groundbreaking, gigantic scandal of international corruption was broken and it was suppressed actively by, uh, you know, the intelligence agencies, the big tech apparatus, the media environment, you know, what, what we call the regime. Uh, you know, that I, you know, the, the fact that these were all things were used to suppress uh, the story. People need to, there needs to be accountability because people are yeah. losing faith in their election, whether it's the ballot or the stories that they hear. And that's not a healthy environment um, for democracy. Yeah. No, there was so much suppression. And I'm so glad that so much of this information is being released. Hopefully, Elon Musk releases much more to come. Um, but Vish, thanks so much for joining us and sharing this with us. Thank you for having me, Danielle. I try to eat healthy, but I'm not a big fan of the flavor of veggies. But I have to admit, when I'm in the produce section, all those vibrant colors of fruits and veggies look really good. Dr. Howard at Balance of Nature told us that all those colors you see in the produce section equal nutritional variety. Different colors signify different key nutrients. If you eat only your favorite one or two veggies, you're missing a whole world of vital nutrients. That's why I take these six little capsules of fruits and veggies each day. Daily Dose is made up of a blend of 31 different fruits and veggies, and that's the only way we can possibly get what we need. So give your body everything it needs with a balance of nature. For a limited time, all new preferred customers will receive an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first balance of nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm excited to bring you my biggest bedding sale ever, just in time for Christmas. Get my Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98. A set of pillowcases, only $9.98. Rejuvenate your bed with a My Pillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. We also have blankets in a variety of sizes, colors, and styles. We even have blankets for your pets. Get duvets, quilts, down comforters, body pillows, bolster pillows, and so much more. All at the biggest discounts ever. 
I know my betting products are perfect for you, and I'm extending my money-back guarantee for Christmas until March 1st, 2023, making them the perfect gifts for your friends, your family, and everyone you know. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen, use your promo code, and you'll get huge discounts on all my pillow bedding products, including my Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98. Get all your shopping done now while quantities last. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.